Happy Labor Day weekend. Um, I really wanted to extend the warmest of all possible welcomes to a Hot Topics webinar that I'm particularly excited and passionate about. Um, it is really my greatest honor this Labor Day Friday to kick off this way. Uh, but first things first, the Hudson Eye is an annual community arts and culture festival. It spotlights local artists, local venues, and local organizations. Um, so we have a lot of really dear colleagues on this one. Um, briefly though, Humanities New York, the JM Kaplan Fund, Fund for Columbia County, and an anonymous stimulus that um, helps community giving in Hudson, New York, is really the name of the game. Um, my name is Jonah Bocaire. I was born close by in New York State uh, to Tunisian and American parents. Um, Aaron Levi Garvey curates the Hudson Eye every year. Um, and it is my joy and my greatest honor to welcome Elena Mosley, who is the executive director of Operation Unite in Hudson and is a colleague in dance and on so many levels. But she, along with the Black Arts and Culture Festival, which is about to have its awards ceremony at 3 p.m. Um, just down the street, if you're in Hudson, um, she has assembled us today under a fantastic context. And I was, I could not contain my excitement actually when I saw the speakers that she assembled for us today, many of them are colleagues. So I'd like to present Aaron Levi Garvey, who is the curator of the Hudson Eye and to say thank you. These will also all be posted online after Labor Day. Thanks so much and stay safe. Hi everyone, uh, it's Aaron Levi Garvey. Here we are again with our Hot Topics series, uh, live from Hudson Hall and abroad. Um, we're, today we're presenting a panel organized by Elena Mosley, uh, founding member and current director of Operation Unite uh, Education and Cultural Arts Center, a non-for-profit that provides programs for youth and members in Hudson. The panel today will feature moderator James Powell, of the 10th Magazine in discussion with Elijah Hayward and Chief Operating Officer of the International African American Museum and Jill Jones, the Executive, Executive Director of the James Weldon Johnson Literary Estate and Co-Founder and Chairperson of the James Weldon Johnson Foundation regarding the state of Black institutions in America. Following today's webinar, for those of you that are in Hudson, uh, wrapping up the Sankofa Black Arts and Culture Festival this afternoon at 3 p.m., as Jonah mentioned, uh, is the Community Service Awards at the 7th Street Park honoring Mayor Kamal Johnson, Ida Pearl Cross, Brenda Blanks, Emma Gregory, and Annette Perry. Uh, we look forward to this panel together, and I would ask that everyone use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, type all of your questions out, and we'll uh, answer them in order at the end of the chat. All right, enjoy everyone. So good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Elena Mosley, as was mentioned, and we are just delighted to be part of the second annual Hudson Eye. And um, today we're just so honored to have such wonderful guests on our panel. And I don't want to really talk too much about Operation Unite. It's just that we are here in, in Hudson. We're 28 years in existence. And we have had a wonderful relationship with our community partners and our families here within our county. So I'm gonna turn this over and really introduce James Powell, who is part of the 10th Magazine. And I'm gonna have him tell us a little bit about our panelists and we're gonna start our discussion. So without further ado, thank you, James, and welcome. Thank you, Elena, I appreciate it. This is, I love Zoom calls. They're always the most friendliest thing of thank yous and we love these people. It's just great energy in the middle of a sometimes hectic day and what is going on right now with our global shift. Yes, and the flowers as well. I've been on my share of, of virtual calls, but I must say, this is probably the best backgrounds that I've seen in a while. So kudos to you all. I know this is already gonna be a, an exciting call. I also want to say, um, give my appreciation to Jonah and Aaron at the Hudson Eye. You know, the title of this, this conversation today was about museums of the future. But as you all know, 
Hudson Eye keeps his hands on the pulse of what's going on in our local community, in our international community, uh, in arts and culture all over the world. And because of that, and because of the dynamic things that are going on, I'm just so impressed with how we have allowed the conversation to evolve even throughout the, the festival. There have been times where uh, some of the artists, their programs have sold out and they've had to move them to different venues. So they really are capturing the zeitgeist of what's going on right now. And I think the same thing we can apply to this conversation. Originally, it was focused and centered on museums, but it, it, there's a wider uh, scope of things that are going on with our institutions um, and our collective movements. And so we decided to bring in Jill and other folks from the James Weldon Johnson Foundation. And so instead of the traditional reading uh, Jill and uh, Dr. Elijah Hayward III's, uh, their bi bios, I'd like to, to, to kind of let you know how we are connected because th that is the, the strong thing about the African American community and our inspiration of why we do the work that we are doing. Uh, and Elena, when she asked me to, to be on this panel, and she said it, it was, when she said Sankofa, I was like, that's all you have to say. It is about looking back and, and moving forward because Dr. Carter G. Woodson, who we all know as the father of Negro History Week, which is today Black History Month, he said, if a race has no history, if it has no worthwhile tradition, it becomes a negligible factor in the thought of the world, and it faces the danger of complete extermination. And I'm just happy to work with Elena, with Dr. Hayward, and also Jill to share with you all the great work that they're doing to make sure that that does not happen. So I'll start with uh, Jill, because, you know, being up in Hudson, um, I was always, as a child, really, really I didn't know that I was in love with American romanticism. I would meditate looking at black landscape artists and um, one of those, well, a landscape artist. And typically people think, you know, a, a landscape artist during that period is some white man with a big white beard and he's sitting in the middle of the field. Well, there, it actually, there's one of them, Robert Selden Duncanson, who was born in, in New York, was a black man and eventually he probably got a white beard. And he was one of the most famous uh, artists of the second movement of Hudson River Valley School. And I was happy to be in this space and move to the Hudson community for the last two years because what it said to me is that blackness exists everywhere. And so when I moved and I was talking to folks in town, uh, one, of my co one of my friends said, you need to meet Jill Jones because Jill is doing God's work with the James Weldon Johnson Foundation. Did you know that he has a literary estate and a writing college in Great Barrington? I'm like, oh my gosh, I have to speak to this woman. And then serendipitously, she was a mentor, of, uh, she is a mentor of one of my cousins. And I was like, I have to meet this woman. <laughs> so we finally were able to connect over dinner and I want to come back to that a little bit because you shared a very interesting story about how you came into this space and what inspired you. So after I say a little bit about Elijah, Elijah I would like to come back and kind of start off with that, with how, where the spark was. Uh, Dr. Elijah Hayward uh, III, I have to make sure I get it right because he's, he is family. We went to college together, went to Hampton University. We started an organization called The Bigger Circle because we both had a love of art with the Hampton University Art Museum. Elijah is the Chief Operating Officer of the International African American Museum. And it will, it is already had its groundbreaking ceremony and they just put the top on to the new building that is being built on the slave docks of Charleston, South Carolina. And if you all know any history about the, the low country of South Carolina, I would say a majority of the slaves, regardless if they went up north or further into the deep south, had to go through the port of Charleston. And so it's just remarkable that our ancestors are getting uh, a building that is completely dedicated to the international history of African peoples. And I'm happy to say that even during this pandemic, 
they are going full speed ahead. Uh, and so, and, and Elijah has been someone that I have obviously known for a long time. And he does a lot of work with oral Southern and folklore history of, of Black folks in the South. And so I will let them both talk a little bit more about what inspires them. But let's start with Jill. Because Jill, we were having dinner in uh, New York City. And I knew you had uh, acquired this property. And I knew you were you know, in charge. I had inherited this literary estate of James Wilden Johnson. But the stories are really interesting and different of how you came to get the property versus the literary state that you brought together. If you could just share you know, that story with our audience, I know they would love to hear it. Sure, sure. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I hope everyone is having a great day. I'm so happy and honored to be here with you. Um, yes, we were having dinner and I was telling James that uh, from the time I was 11, I uh, was close to a woman named Dr. Sandra Catherine Wilson. She and my mother were getting their doctorates together. And uh, Sandra Wilson um, eventually became a, uh, a James Weldon Johnson scholar over time. In fact, one of the protégés of the Johnsons who was named Mrs. Ollie Sims Ocala, she lived down the hall from uh, Sandra and Sandra befriended her and ended up actually really taking care of her through the end of her life. Um, now, uh, James Weldon Johnson and his wife, Grace Nell Johnson, they didn't have any children. So uh, they left much of what they had, all of their furniture, um, papers, all of their papers uh, to uh, all of the papers that were left. Lots of them are at Yale and Emory, but the papers that were left um, to her and she and her husband didn't have any children. And so she left everything to Sandra. Now, Sandra started telling me stories about James Weldon Johnson, uh, long stories. We'd have two, three hour calls and she just would tell me what she was discovering, uncovering in her research, writing about. And uh, eventually she started to give out a James Weldon Johnson medal. So she gave, uh, she gave medals to people like Carol Mosley Brown, uh, Harry Belafonte, uh, and, and others. And that was done every year at the Schomburg Center in New York, uh, which is the uh, main African, the main library that has African American materials in, in New York. And so uh, at the time, I think I said I was the one who was uh, most gainfully employed among, <laughs> among all of us uh, in my mom's circle and her circle. And so I produced the, I gave the money for um, the, uh, the medal ceremony and that became an annual thing. Uh, and then I eventually ended up on stage and ended up giving out the medal, <laughs> ended up doing much of the whole thing. Now, Sandra, unfortunately uh, passed away in 2010. And I was uh, very sad to hear about it. I mean, we had been very, very close. She left me the literary estate of, the jo of James Weldon Johnson and hers as well. And, uh, and so one day I was on uh, our couch in Jersey City where we live. And I was exhausted from my week at work. I work in um, financial services. And I was flipping through uh, country houses. Like I never thought I would be able to have any other house than the one bedroom apartment I grew up in in New York. But um, I did have friends. I was lucky enough to go to school with people who had country houses. So I thought, well, I'm really craving green and I want to get out. So. Um, get out of Jersey City. And so I was just going through houses and looking at them. And I sort of felt like, well, how do you pick somewhere to be? I mean, how do you have, you have to have a connection to the place. Um, you can't just show up in some town. And uh, especially for us, you know, not only would we, we want to know that we're welcome in that town as well, you know? So, um, so we, so I fell asleep. I was, uh, dozing and I all of a sudden heard Sandra's voice in my ear 
And she said, James Weldon Johnson, Great Barrington. Now I woke up and I thought, I tried to rationalize, what, what was that? Did that just happen? And I actually said, don't rationalize it. Just go ahead and type it into your browser. So I did. And the first thing that came up was African-American leaders house for sale. And that house was the house I am sitting in right now. And that is the summer home of James Weldon Johnson and his wife, Grace Nail Johnson. And this property, so we, my, my husband and I came up, we, we were able to buy the house in a week. Um, and, and people started stopping by and saying, oh, we, we've heard you're not gonna knock the house down. We're so pleased you're gonna preserve it. And what is really extraordinary about this house is that um, there is a writing cabin on the property that is uh, not visible from the road. And it is a, the writing cabin where James Weldon Johnson wrote his most famous work, uh, aside from Lift Every Voice and Sing, of course, um, he wrote a book called God's Trombones. And he also wrote his autobiography in that cabin. And we're gonna preserve it. And we've been working on preserving it. So it's, it's, uh, it is a real pleasure to be the stewards of, of this property uh, while we're here. What an incredible story. I mean, it, 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 it's, it's almost as if, well, it's not almost, there was, it's as if the ancestors are saying, you are supposed to be here. <laughs> and this story is supposed to be preserved. I was just thinking about this morning when I was doing a little bit of reading about James Weldon Johnson, who as a child, as many of us um, who grew up in black institutions and in the black church, especially learning the, the black national anthem. And I, we had just done a photo shoot um, in the last issue of Romanticism about Bob Cole. And mm -hmm. I put together that James Rosamond Johnson, his brother, also was a part of this duo that they were this vaudeville duo that would stay at these bed and breakfasts in Catskills that were owned by several African-American people, mm -hmm. um, much like Oak Bluffs and Martha's Vineyard. Yeah. And so it's interesting how all these connections are made in Hudson and, and, and just the, the imprint that was here because right up the street is, is the birthplace of, and the home site of W.E.B. Du Bois. So Great Bear right. boasts a great deal of history. Before I come back to what, you just, what, the, what program you decided to develop, um, for this Writings College in the Summer House, I'd like to go over to Elijah to speak with him about his story. Because Elijah, you didn't start out as the CEO of, of Dr. Hayward, I'm sorry. Let me get it right, because even though family got to get the titles right. <laughs> but even though you didn't start out as uh, the CEO, you had a journey that took you from Hampton University, um, born in Beaufort. You went to Washington, D.C. for a time, working as a director at the uh, Institute for Responsible Citizenship uh, before you decided it, to go into the space. But it was almost a, a full circle moment because you ended back in the low country where the family roots are. And if you could just tell me about that journey because if anybody should be leaving, leading an initiative like this, it should be you. So. I'd love for you to tell us about how you arrived at, at, at the museum and what was the spark for you as well. Well, first of all, I just want to say uh, thank you to uh, the Hudson Eye for this, this opportunity to be a part of this panel. Um, Elena and Jill, I've heard so much about you from James. So it's great to just have this opportunity to be a part of this discourse and to, to really hear uh, from you directly in lot of your really important work. Jill, um, what you just shared is really, really encouraging and inspiring. So I, I just really excited to, 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 to engage more. Um, and to James, um, I think that in our life, we all need someone that is a champion for who we are, our work, and sees the best in us. And James has been that person since the day I met him. So uh, thank you for your friendship um, and, and all the ways in which you really represent what family means in this life you were living. Um, so to really answer your question, I have always been raised around a strong sense of identity in the African-American experience. I mean, you can't grow up in South Carolina, particularly in the low country, and not understand the power 
potency and importance of black identity in America and the world. And that's something that I've always was uh, really interested in preserving and promoting in any way that I can through the arts, through history, through preserving the oral tradition, but more importantly, through uh, really understanding my own, own background and who I am in a way that allows me to show up in the world in, in a particular way. So, so I really um, have always had an emphasis on allowing my life to be of service in a way that will allow for that protection of identity to be something that can be explored and, and celebrated on all levels. Um, so I think my journey to this role is one that is really providential. Jill, your story is really based on providence, the fact that there's a way in which our lives can unfold that we don't really understand until it actually happens. So for me, I give no, no credit to anything I've done. I think um, I, I'm a part of a, a larger narrative that's been conspired from my grandparents, great-grandparents, but even my faith to bring me to this point. And this endeavor that I'm a part of is one that is a collective endeavor that would not be possible without all the people before me that have sacrificed and believed that a day like today could be, could be a reality despite the challenge that we still face. So I mean, so I would say that um, we all have a responsibility to consider how we make the world a better place. Mine just so happens to be in this moment one uh, contributing to this project of the International African American Museum. And uh, briefly, I could just share that our mission is very simple, but very powerful to share the untold stories of the African American journey at one of America's most sacred sites. As James mentioned, Charleston, South Carolina is the single greatest point of entry for enslaved Africans in, in, the, in the country. So that means that every African American can likely trace one relative to Charleston, which mm -hmm. means that there's a point of pilgrimage that we're part of really preserving that we hope that all Americans can see the power in coming to experience when we open in two years. But more importantly, there's a way in which reframing African-American history in America is the work of justice that needs to happen. As we consider uh, the racial tensions and discourse that's happening in America today, knowing our history, understanding how all this originated through child slavery, through the ways in which we have been misrepresented through our identity and the power of who we are, um, all these things are ways in which we can be an intervention for our future that I think can be really invaluable. So this work of uh, justice work is multi-level. You know, it, it happens in different ways. And I'm really honored to have the opportunity to be part of it in Charleston that has so much of a robust history from being the start of the Civil War, uh, the outputs of music and culture, uh, and, and even jazz in a particular way, Gullah Geechee identity, um, the first Memorial Day happening in Charleston by, by Black folk. Um, but now re-centralizing Charleston, the number one city in the world for tourism, as a black city in a way that it has always been, as something that I think is very timely, worthy, and important for us to really do the work of reclaiming that we have to do in our country. Oh, thank you, Elijah. That was powerful. Thank you, Elijah and Jill both. I want to go into this space of knowing that the need to, to tell our stories and to not only tell our stories, because at the 10th Magazine, uh, which is a biannual publication and media collective that not only we, the powerful thing about uh, storytelling is having complete ownership of it um, from ideation to fruition. And both the International Museum of African American History and also the James Weldon Foundation uh, has done a great job of doing that. But I want to focus a little bit on Elena because Elena, you obviously saw a need within the Hudson community, within the upstate community, to be able to identify those voices and those artists and those folk stories that you, you, you don't, they don't get the spotlight and they need to be heard because they are equally as important to the fabric of our entire globe and community. So if you could just talk a little bit about the, the Hudson Black Arts Festival and why you saw that there was a need to, to put this together for, for, for everyone in Hudson. Well, the festival had started uh, in a different form before I arrived in Columbia County. So my husband and I arrived in the, around 1980 and we kept hearing about the Black Fest. So when I finally was able to come into Hudson and catch it, we realized that it was, uh, the foundation was laid by families who had been here. And, um, you know, in the 60s, when they started this family block party on Columbia Street. Uh, and um, the event sort of grew. There is a historical 
uh, a women's organization called the Women's Progressive Club, which is not functioning now, but they were a group of black women who were getting together, like the Social Tea Party, that it wasn't a sewing, sewing group, but it was sort of like a tea party, a tea group and getting together. And um, they were really the thread of this community. They were making sure that the kids had books if they needed it. They were supplying many scholarships to some of the younger kids. And they were behind the festival. And they did it for about 10 years. And then when my husband and I arrived, we were asked to take it over. So that's how we came into being. And what we saw was an opportunity to take Hudson and take this block party and make it into a festival where we could highlight the, the um, contributions of African Americans who have contributed so much to our state and our nation as we know it. And it was just something that we weren't seeing. So we just started from there and tapped into some of the grassroots folks that are here that were doing the work, but were going unseen. Um, but like most communities, um, where we gravitate towards each other. There are always people who are doing the work. Maybe they're called aunties and uncles, same, same words in different languages as I'm learning, but they're doing the work. So we really wanted to just elevate that because that's what was needed in Hudson. And then to interject education components and just references of um, information. So when we started out, we did invite speakers to come you know, to come and speak, depending on what was going on, you know, at that time. Um, it could have been um, political or, or just issues that were at hand. And then in terms of increasing the attendance, making sure that we kept the integrity of the families and having something for families and, children's and uh, children and entertainment. Um, but along that, the parallel of being in a community um, such as Hudson was understanding that the elevation of the community at large was really what was at stake. So if the festival was gonna happen once a year, it had to do more things. And so many things were behind the scenes. So a lot of people would come out for the day to be entertained or, or you know, things like that. But we knew that there were other things. So this festival gave us an opportunity to have workshops, to have speakers, to gather the black churches for Columbia and Green, because we only have the, a bridge between us, or as some of us say, a bridge connecting us, so that we have um, the communities from both sides. And this festival became the Black Arts Cultural Festival for Columbia and Green County for the Black communities and the Black churches, so that we could have just a gospel night somewhere and you know, really started putting these things in there. Um, but like I said, there was that parallel journey that had to be brought along. So we could be known as the festival, but really the real work was identifying the youth and the families and starting to work on the education components. And it didn't matter how small, uh, you know, how small the activity would be, but just to get it going and to start introducing the arts as a platform, because that was the, for me, that's my passion. And that's what I saw was missing, that the arts wasn't really here. And I was a strong believer from living in the library and reading, that the arts really influence the makeups of our brain. You know, playing the music for my kids early and, and reading and, and dance, and how do you dance without music? So to have the arts interjected into the activities that we were doing and then do a festival, that was great. It would get people out. But again, it gave us the opportunity to grab onto the youth, to talk to the adults, to know that, oh, there was going to be a jazz, a jazz group coming in, you know, things like that. And that's what invokes conversation. That conversation invokes more interest. And then we get to have a really discussion amongst the families and amongst the communities about who we are, where are we coming from, and what do we want to be. And then I would say, well, what do we want Hudson to be? Because we are here. So if we want Hudson to be this or we want Hudson to be that, it's our responsibility to bring it to the platform, to put it on the table, and then make sure that we're grabbing different people of different ages so that it can continue. I mean, that's kind of where we are with, with, the, with the festival. Now that we, thank you, Elena, um, now that we've spoken about the, the past, 
I want to focus on our present and also our future. We, a year ago, I was sitting on a panel here at Hudson Eye uh, in, Hudson, in Hudson Hall where we are right now. And it was a much different scene. Uh, there were people in the room, there were no masks, there was no hand sanitizer. <laughs> we were all together and uh, we could hug, we could shake hands. And that has, the pandemic has quickly shifted that. And also during that shift, we've also seen the upheaval in um, social and political sort of dismantling in this country and really questioning the institutions that have been, along for, uh, been around for a long time. Some of these things had happened before. And, I, and one, of, one of the things I want to point out is uh, technology. Technology is definitely emblematic of the future. And a lot of our institutions are, have to, are almost forced in a way to make, uh, to have some sort of digital footprint to make it accessible to all people. But the irony in that is that not everybody has access to the technology. Not everybody has Wi-Fi. Not everyone has a computer. I mean, I have relatives who live in rural South Carolina who still use satellites, you know, and if the wind blows in the wrong direction, there is nothing. And so, um, but now, uh, coincidentally, you know, we, coincidentally, we have to rely more on these digital spaces like we are today to connect with people. I want to talk a little bit about how if you guys could if you all could tell us a little bit about your programs initially i know jill you had a writing residency um if we could talk a little bit about your current program and how that has impact how how the pandemic has impacted that and how you see going forward in the future but also how you can still create some sense of accessibility for those who may not have the tools to be able to connect Sure, yes. Uh, so we have a couple of different programs. One is that we are in the process of restoring the writing cabin of James Weldon Johnson. So that's critical to us. Uh, and the other is an artist residency, which you just mentioned. Um, in that artist residency, we welcome artists from everywhere. We have uh, filmmakers and uh, painters and um, jewelers and, and all kinds of uh, people who do very, very interesting work, emerging, mid-career and established artists. And uh, we have partnered with uh, Bard College at Simons Rock where you know, there's a premier arts facility and uh, our artists uh, have stayed at Simons Rock and used that facility for each of the past three years, except for this one. So the prior three years. And uh, we had to cancel this year because it just didn't make any sense to um, bring people here and everything was so unstable. It was really unclear what was going to happen back in March and April. Uh, I think it was also um, more immediately scary then. Uh, now we, you know, over time we have known we can go out with our masks, we can keep our hands clean. You know? But at that point, we knew much less about this virus. And so um, we, we are always uh, doing those programs, uh, doing the, the program to restore the cabin. But what we've done this year instead, instead of having what we call our James Weldon Johnson Fellows in the Arts, what we've done is we've decided uh, to do, uh, to take all of the artists who've been with us over the past three years, which is 14 people. Uh, and we have, uh, we're going to spot, uh, we're going to commission them to do a piece of work, which then we're going to, uh, reproduce and we're going to offer that to the public and our the people who support us and uh and give some of that back to the artists of course uh and uh, that's how we're going to adjust for this year um i do hope we can do this again next year because there's just something so special about having everyone together we also usually have a um a garden gala every year uh, in June. And we do it right around James Weldon Johnson's birthday, which is June 17th. 
And, um, and everyone thinks we're celebrating Juneteenth, so why not? <laughs> well, we had started around his birthday. And, um, and so we're, we're, we're very focused on making sure that we're connected to our artists and we're connecting our artists uh, in the ways that we can during this pandemic. I, I do want to just say uh, there was a, just something I wanted to share. I, I wanted to share a quotation from James Weldon Johnson that I think very much encapsulates, Elena, what you were saying and Elijah, uh, what you were saying. So uh, this is my favorite quote of his, quotation of his. It's the final measure of the greatness of all people is the amount and standard of the literature and art they have produced. Mm. The world does not know that a people is great until that people produces great literature and art. So that's that, that power of art, the power of the, the word, the, the written word, um, is something that we're very much trying to encourage, support, uh, and, and we need our artists now because our artists are the people who help to really interpret our world for us and, and to show it back to us. And so we're very, very um, committed to, to art uh, and literature. And we're also very committed to social justice. Now our social justice programs are, we're developing them, but as everyone I'm sure knows, um, Johnson was a huge social justice warrior, yes. uh, and uh, and we plan to uh, to advance that part of his legacy as well. No, that's such a, I mean that that makes you know that just sends shivers, and it's visceral that that sentiment because it also makes me think about Charles White who said something similar, uh, who has several murals at Hampton University. And he said, art is the, the story of humanity. And mm. it very much so is true. You know, when the ruins, when, when the ruins are, are there amongst them, we will always find the art and they will tell us the story. It is something beyond the, you know, just commodifying, we obviously yeah. going to eat, but it really is vital um, to be able to say that we were here, we existed. And so that leads me into a, a great question. And I, I wanna come back to a thought later, Jill, um, to kind of close out, but uh, a question that I have specifically for Elijah and Elena is, you all are dealing with events and, and your museums have traditionally these big event spaces, these big programs where you have, you know, well over a hundred people, but obviously right now that is not a reality. And so similar to how Jill has had to um, rethink um, how you, know, you go forward, I want to know from both of you, starting with Dr. Hayward, what is your plan in place to have people to still be able to engage with these institutions, but for them to be safe? I mean, there is something that you cannot replace by being in physical spaces, the edifice, the building itself is a, is a character, is a spirit. It helps us to really absorb what we're talking about. So I want to know briefly how you all are addressing that. And then I'll take one more question and we can go into Q&A. But uh, Dr. Hayward. Alan Moore is quoted as saying, uh, art makes, makes us feel less alone. And uh, there's a way in which that, is, that resonates from an individual uh, perspective of, of how art, particularly in the African-American experience, allows us to see representations of ourselves in a society that may not always honor the complexity of our, of our experience, but also um, the, the function of buildings and institutions like museums to be places for convening, places where ideas are shared, and places that transform our reality and impression of the world around us. I think the biggest challenge of the pandemic is that we are really alone right now in the sense that isolation has become more of our, of our approach to life than not. And I think that, you know, there are ways in which we've engaged a creative impulse to reform shape how, that, how we engage one another. So we have the benefit, and it feels really awkward to say because uh, there's so much suffering happening. And I want to acknowledge the fact that 
I know we've all been touched by the pandemic in some way. So I definitely want to honor the um, the grave, a reality of our of our economic experience as Americans, particularly African African Americans, but also um, just the ways in which the pandemic has impacted all of our lives. Um, but I think as an institution, we have the benefit of not being open right now, and we're in startup mode. So we are still creating the exhibits. We're still building out the African Ancestors Memorial Garden that marks the spot that Jane spoke about earlier. We're still doing all the things that will make us operational and functioning in two years. So we're able to learn lessons uh, about how um, you know, folks are dealing with this really complex moment, this unprecedented, unprecedented time in our history. Um, but you know, as it stands, the programming that we do offer is all virtual. Uh, we're able to benefit from platforms you know, such as the one we're using right now to really test out ways that we can share information and engage and also lean on the whole notion of the digital space and world. You know, even when we open, we will have a brick and mortar building. We wanna brand ourselves as a museum beyond the walls to ensure that people who may not have the accessibility to come to Charleston can learn and benefit from the important work that we're doing there. Uh, so I, I'm looking forward to hearing from Elena and, and what you're doing because we can definitely take notes and see you know, what, what lessons you might have to share. Thank you, Elijah. Elena? Well, I'd say that uh, initially with the pandemic setting in, uh, it was really about our young folks, our youth. And um, we, we were all inside. So going in and going out was, was a faraway dream, I think, for all of us at that, at that point, because we had never been through a pandemic. But for the youth, it was about having programming and all of a sudden learning about Zoom and being on it. So the first thing I did was create a, 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 like a, a, a work pattern of coming to work three times a week where we would be on Zoom and um, letting them take the initiative to talk about themselves because I realized that the panic had set in and it, it just was, the impact was tremendous. And I was seeing different sides of what was going on with these young people. And some of them had been with me for two or three years um, and the stress levels. And then being a teenager, um, not being able to socialize. I mean, all of those things were, were the impact. So one, one meeting we'd have a, a, a Zoom meeting and somebody would be um, on, on, a, um, on the spotlight and they were cooking uh, French fries, and the next person was making the best tuna fish sandwich that her family enjoys when company comes, you know, things like that. Um, the next one, we were all on it learning the TikTok dance. You know, <laughs> another one, we were doing um, songs, and they were, you know, they were on sites. I mean, things I've never seen, you know, whatever, but they know what they're doing. And we were doing that just to have fun, but also to, for me in my head, to allow them to learn about that leadership part and take, take that role. And another time we would have, um, I call it the check-in meeting and we would just talk about what was happening and I'd be assigning news stations that they never listened to. Everybody had to come and tell me something different about the pandemic. And then it was a history moment and, and, and teaching about what the pandemic was in 1918 for the world and how it affected us and where does it bring us forward now? And then I was getting comments about, oh my God, nobody told us like that we didn't know. Well, you weren't in school at the time, but it, that was the job that I saw, was to take our youth and help them get through this and focus and then start to say, can you see the light at the end of the tunnel? We're all in this, but look at all the wonderful things that we can do and the joy. And if I could, I had um, John Campbell, who's a Columbia County resident filmmaker, uh, as a guest. I'd bring in a couple of people to be a guest so that I can still talk about careers and things like that. So that was the extent of my program. It was like Zoom that I never heard of before. And that's what we did. And then it was about, well, what do we normally do? So we, our Youth Government Day for, for our Hudson was happening the day before the multicultural festival that we were involved in. And they all were happening the week that the school closed. So for them, it was a really crush. The pandemic hadn't set in yet. It was school was closing. Oh my gosh, my world is changing and we're not gonna do this program and we're not gonna do that and have fun. So um, I did deal with that. But then as we move along, it was about, well, what are we going to do this year for the festival? Because it is a training point about, I call it community 101, community events 101, where the youth really learn 
who the movers and shakers are. It's you, the volunteers who step up. And, and no, no one's getting paid for this. This is what really happens. And so we have to keep that going. And out of that birth, this Sankofa virtual festival. Because if we were going along our regular path, I would have never thought about a virtual festival. So this virtual festival is the event and I see it as part of our fabric now. Like you said, you know, two years from now, Dr. Hayward, you're gonna have this established. And that's what I see also. I see taking some of this, uh, the content from this festival and um, repeating it during Black History Month so that we can reach more people. Um, I, I see um, the future of our events, the continuum of our partnerships. We're sitting here in Hudson Hall. Uh, as uh, James mentioned, he was here before um, Hudson High. I mean, Hudson Eye has had um, their annual um, and daily panels. Um, Hudson Hall has been uh, a, uh, a pillar and major partnership for Operation Unite New York, along with the Hudson City School District. So I'm looking at these events, like what we're being able to do now, and how do we all take this and redefine ourselves because we're all redefining what we're gonna look like because we don't know in six months that we're really gonna be open. So for me, I would say moving forward past the virtual festival is to continue to use it as a tool for education um, as, as well. So um, the, uh, I just wanna say um, I'm curating this festival and along with um, JD Urban, who is the videographer and, and he's putting all the technical pieces together. And what I have found is that we are really curating it together because without his um, technical skills, I wouldn't have had the Black History moment. I've always do something with the students for the festival so they can highlight themselves and learn. But we now have a Black History section that the students are doing as part of the Sankofa, as well as their individual talks, which are learning about their heart and what they see around their world. So those are the events now. That, that are happening, that I'm learning from. And, um, and working with JD has been wonderful and having the opportunity to coordinate the summer students here at Hudson Hall and for Operation Unite, we, we are learning a lot and those are the events. So I don't really see us um, doing too, too, too many new things along those lines. So I would say the main point is to keep focusing on the youth for their education and learning about um, the world and what's happening. I don't worry that I don't have a curriculum that says social justice. We always do it and I tell the students. I use their community and the neighboring community to learn about the social issues. And then we go to a play or we go to a talk. So we do that. And then to maintain our partnerships that we have here in the community. And they will become the events that we, that we have and that we do together. Thank you. Elena, I know we're getting to the two o'clock hour, so Jonah, I was wondering, do we have any questions from the audience before? I mean, this I yes. guess I talk all day, but with these wonderful people, but yes, can we, can we have some questions for us? Well, I, I, think, I think that the, this illustrates once again, one of, the, um, one of the most inspiring, if not the highest qualities of dialogue that we've been able to enjoy and I really would like to thank each one of you for that. Um, it, is, it is a cause for gratitude. It really is. So, so thank you. I also would like to, as Elena said, to build a bridge. And um, Elena and myself are working on a possible program together in future years called Building Bridges. Um, that is with the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation, we hope. So what I would like to say um, is two things. One is to is supportive, is to say that we are aware that the award ceremony is in 65 minutes. <laughs> so we hope that for those of us that are in Hudson that we can go and support the award ceremony, um, which is also happening in person at safe, different, at safe distances in the park, really so that we make sure that there are no digital orphans left behind in our beautiful community. But um, James is a return panelist and I, I love him dearly, but I hope you'll allow me to, um, allow me the, I don't know, the, the again, the support, but also the comfort um, to share something that I could use a hand with actually. Um, and I don't have all the answers, but I wanted to make a bridge to the fact that this is also, we knew 2020 may have had some challenges be it an election, be it 
a pandemic, be it, you know, the list is long. But this is also a census year. And the thing that I would like to put into the space is that according to the United States, there is no Middle Eastern identification option in this nation's census. And according to the United States, there is no Middle Eastern race yet. Um, the Asian races have conjugated in that census, um, although, you know, just feeling very comfortable, it used to be that some of those races wished to exist as a subset of Caucasian. And that is no longer the case. So this language is going to shift in our lifetime. Um, it was Oriental. It is now currently living sort of precariously as Middle Eastern, but we're going to see Mena, Mesa and Menasa, meaning Middle East and North African, which are, which are my origins, Middle East, North African and South Asian, and how this all starts to get really specific. So during this census year, I just wanted to say, um, and this is something Elena and I are kind of like sharing notes on is um, how can we do better for Hudson and how can we do better for the country? Um, I have a little delay on you. I'm muted. Thank you, Jonah. Yeah. That is incredible um, work that you and Elena are doing. I think it makes me think about intersectionality and thinking about the Black experience in this country and throughout the entire world, how we can use some of those examples to help, you know, our brothers and sisters from other parts of the world to be identified and to not be erased. Um, and that's, that's incredibly important. And I'm glad that you brought that up. And it helps me to go into sort of my closing questions for each, if we don't have any from the group, is, you know, we, we are living in a time where people, you know, we are shouting from the rooftops and, and Jill as with James Bolden Johnson with Lift Every Voice and Sing, we know that Black Lives Matter has been a movement for people within, within communities, especially even with our allies for centuries and years saying that we belong here. Um, I think that the help of a community, you know, some people might say, well, why do I need to support someone from the Middle East? Why do I need to support an institution that is just talking about a specific culture? What, in a couple of you know, seconds, could you guys each say how important it is if we support these groups that are constantly being marginalized and silenced, how it will benefit for the overall community. I think that, and what you, like what you were saying, Jonah, and if I could just get like a really quick sound bite from all of you, that would be great. And Jill, we can start with you. Sure. Um, I, I think that it is so critical to support each other, to support all of our uh, young, mostly young people, <laughs> but everyone who's going out and, and uh, marching and protesting. I think it's so critical to support these individual institutions because we're, each institution is supporting so many individuals. Um, we are, it is a way to show support uh, for, for example, Black Lives Matter, to go through an institution like Dr. Hayward's or like the Johnson Foundation, which then, uh, sorry, and Elena, of course, all of your amazing work that you're doing in Hudson, to then um, be able to get that influence and, and, and those voices out into the community uh, or of the community out into the world. So I think if you're supporting one, you're actually supporting many, many, many people and connecting us all. Thank you, Joe. Dr. Hayward. James, I feel like our, our Southern hospitality isn't working here because I, I feel like Elena should definitely go first. <laughs> well, I'm letting her go last. <laughs> but, but I'll say that, uh, first of all, thank you for this opportunity. It's, it's amazing to have uh, a chance to share our story with this part of the country. So thank you so much. Um, you know, I, I don't think there's anything more to say here. Um, there's a way in which all of our work is bound. We have a common mission and aim. 
And if, if I mean, my, my father always says enough, there's enough success for everyone. So the success that each of you are able to contribute to supports our project and allows us to do our part to support you as well. So there's a collective part, Tancopa, about all this that really is important to keep at the forefront of everything. And I'm just excited to be able to have some new co-conspirators in this endeavor that we have a commitment to, to bring into life. That's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Elena? Well, I, I want to say that uh, I'm sitting here trying to remember um, my, my, my grandmother's uh, birth date and my mother's uh, birth date, but my grandmother was born in 1910. We're from St. John's Island, and I always heard about Charleston and, you know, and our family. And uh, so there's always things that connect us, you know, when, when we meet and get together. I want to say that um, when I was speaking about the youth and keeping them together so that they can, uh, you know, really make their way like all of us and find a place to get through this pandemic, one of the things that was happening was PPP. And because of that program, I was able to stay open um, even though we work from home, but keep, keep our small staff um, employed as well as uh, the employment of the youth program. And it was through that and, the, and donations that, small donations that were coming in um, that I was able to keep afloat. And what does that mean for, for um, folks about employment? Well, it means more than just keeping somebody employed because for the youth, they represented their families. And as long as I was able to make sure that they were receiving a paycheck every two weeks, that meant that that money was going home to their families because most of the families had one or two members not working at that time. And then we were trying to circulate about food and where the food pantries were and trying to find money and other services in the region, even Albany, that could help some of the families here. Um, so those are just things that were happening behind the scenes. And I think all of the organizations that serve the community, have things like that. So Operation Unite is, is no different. We may be a small organization, but our heart is very big. So supporting organizations uh, like us that are, that are doing all of these things, it means a lot. It is, makes a tremendous difference. So it's not only gonna be about a physical program or visual program that you can see, it's you as a donor reaching in and it really is spreading out and helping others. So um, um, the impact is tremendous and, and we hope that people will continue to donate and we will continue to work to try to connect us all together. Thank you so much to everyone, to Elena, to Jill, to Dr. Hayward, to Jonah, to Aaron, um, to uh, another Elena um, that spelled with the A and all of the Hudson I. Uh, team. I mean, this has been an incredible conversation. And the best conversations are when we leave with homework. And so I think we all have work to do collectively. And like Dr. Haywood said, we have new allies, we have new people that are on our team. I just would like, I would feel really bad if I didn't do this. I would just like to take five seconds to have a moment of silence to honor those who are on the front line, our artists, and also sadly those that we have lost during this year, especially because of COVID-19, but knowing that they are still with us, fighting and telling us to move forward. So COVID-19, but also uh, police brutality. Yes, and, and yeah. thank you, Elijah. Sorry thank to you. interrupt you, but yeah. Thank you, Elijah, thank you so much. I meant Dr. Hayden. <laughs> so if we can just take five seconds. Thank you, um, peace be with all of you, and I appreciate you all. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, James, great job. Thank you, thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you, great job to all of you. <laughs> thank you. Take care. <laughs> Take care. Thank you, James. Thank you.